Well, hello, everyone. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to the Cape Cod Maritime Museum's Fall 2022 Lecture Series. We have something very special planned for you today. Uh, I am Mary Everett Patrickwin, the Museum's Public Programs Coordinator. And again, um, we're so glad that you're joining us for today's talk. Uh, just a couple of quick reminders um, before we get started. Um, you can use the chat feature today uh, for two different purposes. So if you have a question for our speaker, you can type it into the chat box. Uh, you can do that at any time, although we're going to be doing all questions at the end. Um, you can type them into the chat at any point uh, during the talk that you would like. And if you have any technical issues, um, you, you, you've lost the sound, you've lost the video, please type that into the chat and uh, I will uh, chat back to you and let you know how you can go about uh, fixing that. So uh, with that in mind, uh, again, we have something very special planned for you today. A speaker some of you may already know, she has a BA from Ithaca College and an MA in Collections Management from John F. Kennedy University. She is our very own Executive Director, Elizabeth York. Liz, how are you? Great, thank you. How are things in Raynham? They are good. It's a it's a very dreary day, but it's, <laughs> it's you know, such is life. It's, it's that time of year. All right, let me get my screen share up here for you guys. <clears throat> All right. Okay, let's get back to the beginning. Okay. So let's see here. Let's make sure you guys. All right. So thank you guys so much for coming. Um, it's really great to, to see everybody here today. Um, Mary did a great intro, but I'm sure you guys already know I am the executive director at the Cape Cod Maritime Museum. I have been here since August of 2020. Um, and prior to that, I was the curator and the director of collections at Battleship Cove in Fall River. And it was there that I gained a majority of my knowledge for today's lecture, um, as I worked really closely with the PT Boats curator there, um, Don Shannon. Hi, if you're watching. So let's get started. So PT Boats are really fascinating things, um, in my very humble opinion. Um, they're very special. Their crews were very special. And um, from the Navy Department's Bureau of Ships Publications, know your PT boat of 1945, pictured here on the right. A PT boat is, like every man of war, a PT is made for only one purpose, to meet the enemy and destroy him wherever he can be found. So we're gonna take, um, we're gonna time travel back to prior to World War I. Um, and then we're gonna get into World War II in a little bit. Um, so we all know from our history books that the marriage of torpedoes and submarines proved to be very destructive during World War I. The rise of German U-boats and the Lusitania being just a few examples of how destructive torpedoes can be. But interestingly though, uh, motorboats that could carry and launch torpedoes were still in their infancy during World War I. Germany, England, and America were still experimenting with um, the capability, the ability to, of motorboats to carry and launch torpedoes at this time. Um, some of the early designs of motorboats that were able to carry torpedoes ranged between 40 and 90 foot boats. The British in particular had the coastal motorboat. You can see that here in this image. Um, they dubbed it the CMB. And this was a design adaptation from a hydroplane racing boat. So in 1937, uh, MacArthur was the commander of the US forces in the Philippines. He saw the weaknesses in the defenses of those islands in the light of Japanese expansionism at this point. And in 1938, Congress approved a supplement to the US naval budget for the construction of experimental vessels, none of which shall exceed 3,000 tons standard displacement, I quote. The sum of 15 million was soon earmarked to be spent at the discretion of the president himself. And having seen those British CMBs during World War I, Roosevelt really understood their value and understood their yet unrealized potential. And within days of this 15 million budget approval, 
the Navy sponsored a design competition for these small vessels um, with two sizes. They, they asked for two different sizes and they were designed uh, to answer the question, quote, is it possible to build a small ship extremely fast and still seaworthy, which can deliver a real knockout punch to a capital ship? So this design competition and its subsequent tests by the Navy became, became known as the Plywood Derby. There were two different boat designs that were ordered. The smaller was to hold only two torpedoes and have a smaller range or a slightly shorter range of 240 miles and have a 20 ton displacement. The larger of the other two of the two vessels was to have at minimum two torpedoes. So be able to carry at minimum, not at maximum, along with a along with also carrying depth charges and anti-aircraft machine guns. The top speed of this larger vessel was to be a minimum of 40 knots, and this vessel's cruising range was to be 550 miles. So from 1938 to 1939, the first six PT boats were built. The first four were the modified smaller designs, and then the fifth and sixth PT boats to be built were of the larger, um, the larger design. So later 1939 saw the construction of two more larger PT boats that were also modified to be 80 feet long. By this time, the Navy had adopted the term patrol torpedo boat in reference to these vessels, which, you know, assigning each one a PT number. And this is where the, the, the moniker PT boats came from. So, <clears throat> sorry, my computer's a little bit slow. By late 1941, there were several manufacturers of PT boats that supplied the U.S. Navy's needs. Elko, located in Bayonne, New Jersey, answered the call to design a PT boat and improved on this design over the next two years. As they began to improve their design, Elko ended up doubling the size of its plant and tripled its capacity to build PT boats. And at the height of their production, they could produce on average one PT boat every 60 hours. They produced at first a few 70-foot boats and then 77-foot boats, and then eventually improved on the design with their final 80-foot boat. By the end of the war, Elko made the 300 and Elko made 399 PT boats, uh, mostly mostly of the 80-foot design. Higgins Industries in New Orleans, Louisiana, also answered this call. And while Higgins also gets often equated with the beach landing crafts, they also produced quite a few PT boats for World War II. While stubbier and shorter in design and appearance than the Elkos at 78 feet, they were often referred to as a box with a point on one end, uh, probably quoted by competitive Elko crews. So, if anyone here has seen McHale's Navy, the boat in McHale's Navy was a Higgins vessel. Higgins built a total of 199 PT boats during the war. The third yet lesser known contender in the PT boat game was Huckins Yacht Corporation out of Jacksonville, Florida. Their design was similar to the stubby Higgins, but their vessel was powered by four Packard engines in two engine rooms versus the three in the Elko and Higgins. Huckins built a total of 18 boats, all of them serving as either training boats or at outposts like the Panama Canal or in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, for those that know their yachts and their wooden boats, Huckins is still in business today building beautiful yachts. So by the end of these tests or by the end of the Plywood Derby, the Elkos were judged to be faster and drier but the Higgins came in at a close second because of their tighter turn radius. The Huckins boat was judged overall as less desirable than Elko and Higgins, but only because the two others beat them out and not because of any major deficiencies. So as I mentioned a second ago, Elko's had two designs. They had the earlier 77 footers and they also had the later 80 footers. And now while the 80 footers were only three feet longer, they were a completely different boat that really capitalized on the changes that the earlier 77 footer really needed. And while the 80, the 80 footer was slightly slower and less maneuverable than the 77 footer, 
as well as five tons heavier, it actually rode better in the water and could carry a heavier load than the 77 footer. And it also had more armor plating and was much preferred by their crews because they had more spacious cruise quarters and berthing. So this is, great, this is a great photo here of the construction process at the Elko plants. They had a very unique construction process for their PT boats. The boats were constructed, constructed upside down, made with laminated spruce, white oak, and mahogany frames. So there was actually no plywood, even though it was called the plywood derby. derby there was no plywood used. All of the joints were secured with screws and marine glue, the main frames were covered in marine plywood and then sealed. The planking was applied in two layers that ran diagonally to each other, and these were of six by one mahogany boards. And interestingly, between the two layers of these diagonal um, uh, uh, boards was actually a, a layer of um, aircraft fabric that had been soaked in marine glue. And this was sort of sandwiched between the two layers, which helped to add strength as well as watertight integrity. Uh, after that, the boat would then be turned over and then the deck would be planked, the superstructure put on, uh, the fuel tanks added, the engines added, running gear added, and then the interior would be finished off from there. So <clears throat> the layout of all of the PTs mostly included the same basic components. Below decks would include a berthing or living space for the crew. There would be a small galley. Of course, they had to have a head. There would be a wardroom and then staterooms and, and a separate head for the officers aboard as well. The galleys included a set of hot plates, a small fridge, as well as a toaster if the crew could find one or scrounge one up. All of the sailors' belongings were kept in their bunks and in their lockers. And I love this image here. Let me get my laser pointer out real quick. I love this image here behind these guys. This is where the enlisted crew would eat uh, in their main birthing space right around this corner here. Um, but you can see that their bunks are right behind this guy's back right here. And that's where all of their personal effects would be kept. They also had lockers. Um, so... While um, the Elkos tended to have most of their birthing space located forward on this vessel, they also had what was called a day room uh, towards the center of the, of the vessel on a sort of half deck. That's going to be right around here. Um, and it was situated over the gas tanks for the three Packard engines. Now, I'm sure you can probably imagine that in some cases this proved to not be a great place to have crew living. Um, especially with the uh, very volatility of the uh, aviation fuel for these Packard engines, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but it was a very popular place for the Motor Max who would be on duty in the engine room to sort of catch a couple, uh, a few hours of rest when they weren't on watch. So the engine room was all the way aft in Elko's, and it contained all three of the engines in the same compartment. Directly aft of the engine room was a small onboard workshop that they would use to repair radar and other machinery, and this was dubbed the Lazarette. The only main difference between the Higgins and the Elko's um, was the day room, as well as the fact that the engine room on the Higgins were much more centralized, located a little bit further forward on the vessel, and these engine rooms were much larger than those on the Elko's, and we'll see some great photographic example of that, examples of that in a few minutes. Um, ammunition, ammunition was kept on board in lockers um, below or in ready boxes. So the layout of, uh, sorry, the top sides of the PT boats included a small bridge where the quartermaster would steer the boat. And while the skipper, uh, the skipper himself would be manning the throttles and then aiming the torpedoes from the bridge. The throttle controls were connected to a telegraph enunciator that ran down to the engine room and was located in the engine room. So based on the gear that the skipper wanted the boat to be in, whether that's a head, a stern, or a neutral, uh, the telegraph enunciator would ring a bell or a horn or a buzzer for the motor Mac in the engine room to shift the gears of the engines, depending on what the skipper wanted. So once the boat was in gear for a head, the skipper themselves had control of the throttle for the engine, which really just meant that they could control the speed of the vessel, but not the gear. 
So um, they could control the throttle and that ran um, via cables that led down to the engines. Um, very interesting layout there. Um, if you've ever been on a PT boat, look for those cables and they really run through some interesting, they run through the uh, officer's wardroom. Anyways, so uh, immediately below the pilot house was the radio and communication room or chart room, basically all three of the same things in one space. The navigator and the radio men, here's a great image here on the right hand. Uh, the navigator and radio men would keep in contact with their squadron from here. They would monitor their radar if they had one. And they would also use this to keep the boat on course, communicating with the quartermaster and the skipper. So in this right-hand image, on the left of the right-hand image is a, um, uh, sorry, on the, the left image is the shot of a bridge in a, Piggins, in a Higgins boat. This is from PT-625. You can see just how spartan the arrangements on, on the, the bridge were. You've got the helm, you've got the throttle controls there, and then a few other additions, but very spartan. On the right-hand image is the interior of the chart house that I just described. Again, this is on the same Higgins boat, uh, PT-625. On the left hand of that right hand image, there's the radar console, and then we can just make out a radio receiver on the right hand there. So the PT boats were powered by three Packard engines that took high test aviation gas. I was just speaking about how the gas would be stored. This gas was 100 octane aviation gas. Uh, the, the Packard engines were 12 cylinders. Uh, they had 1350 horsepower. Some of them even had higher horsepower, about 1500 horsepower. Um, and these engines were capable of upwards of 40 knots. The highest speed that um, the Navy ever found these vessels to be at was 47 knots, and that was under a Navy test. So the Packard engine that you see here and that all the PT boats used was really an outgrowth of the 750 horsepower Liberty aircraft engine that was introduced to aircraft in 1925. And while later model Packards were designed to have 1500 horsepower, like I just uh, described, the power increase didn't actually mean much. Um, it actually coincided with heavier loads kept ab aboard the vessel, so it didn't always mean an increase in speed. The engines themselves had three gears, um, reverse or astern, neutral, and ahead. <clears throat> So this is a this is one of my favorite photographs. This is a popular photograph of a motor Mac at work in the engine rooms. You can see how they would shift the gears with their hands. Um, and my favorite part about it is that he just really looks thrilled to do his job. Um, it's he, he he looks so happy to be there. So this is a view into the engine room on a 77 foot Elko boat and on the Elko 77 footers, the wing engines, uh, the two um, wing engines were V drive. So the only the center engine actually drove its shaft directly. The V drives were only a disadvantage um, on the 77 footers and that the extra gearing tended to cut down slightly on engine output. And the units were kind of just one more piece of equipment that had to be maintained and then Murphy's Law could fail at any critical time. The 80 foot Elcos were modified to be direct drive because of this. So all three engines actually drove its own shaft and propeller. So in this image, we are facing aft towards the lazarette, and you can see those exhaust vents coming out um, of the engines going straight across the lazarette and then straight out the transom there, right at the uh, um, aft of the vessel. So here are two photographs of the interior of a Higgins engine room. And you can see that compared to the last photograph we just looked at, um, it's much more spacious. A motor Mac of average height would be able to stand up completely comfortable in here. Um, so from my experience at Battleship Cove, I am a five foot three person. Um, and in the Elko rooms, you're kind of sort of monkeying around, climbing over the engines. In the Higgins, I could actually stand up comfortably with a few more inches um, above me for the main deck there. So the Motomax, I think, probably might have enjoyed working in these engine rooms a lot more because they weren't as cramped. Um, so in the left-hand image here, we are looking aft. Um, and there's the central engine right here. Uh, 
uh, just behind this ladder. This is how the guys would um, come in and out from the main deck. Those two big black hoses here are actually the exhaust pipes. And this is another great way to be able to tell the difference between an Elko and a Higgins vessel, whether the exhaust comes out the side or whether it comes out the transom. So um, the Elko boats, they had the exhaust come straight out the back. Um, we're going to see some great images of that in a second. So the image here on the right is looking forward um, towards the, the forward end of the vessel, and you can see both of the wing engines visible here. On the Higgins, each, each engine itself was direct drive, and it operated its own screw, its own propeller, and this increased the maneuverability of the Higgins boats quite a bit. That was one of the reasons why the Navy liked them so much, because they were really, they were able to take really tight turns. They were very maneuverable. Um, now, of course, like I said, they had manually shifted transmissions. You can see those big uh, gear sticks here, those large handles. Um, Orders, like I had described a little bit before, the orders to shift gears had to be sent down from the bridge with that telegraph enunciator, and changing the gears was not a quick or immediate process. It would take a few seconds, especially uh, depending on whether the motor back was actively listening or not. So um, that's one thing to keep in mind. Another thing to keep in mind is that these engines, these are very loud engines. It's, if anyone's heard the sort of really big, powerful cigarette boats that um, are, you know, sort of powering around occasionally in the summertime months, uh, these engines are very similar to those. They're really, really loud. They're also very hot. So one can really imagine how loud and hot these spaces would be, which is why those telegraph enunciators would, would also be uh, very similarly loud to get the attention of the motor Mac. So <clears throat> I mentioned the exhaust on these boats. So um, these were very loud engines. And when you're in a war zone and you're trying to sort of be sneaky and stealthy, a loud engine is really kind of not ideal. So the Navy needed a way to keep these boats stealthy and quiet. Um, the job of PT boats was really to get in close to their enemies and then fire torpedoes at them. So this couldn't be done if the boat was really loud. People, you know, your, their enemy would hear them. They would find out. And so that's where butterfly valves came in. So the exhaust on Elko boats um, comes right out the transom here. Um, these three pipes here, six pipes rather. And they are above the water line. So they would be loud. So the butterfly valves, these valves here would be shut, which would force the exhaust down through these mufflers and then down underwater. This would help cut down on the noise. It would make it much more quiet. Um, but in order to be really quiet, you just have to run at low speed. You literally just have to be running at low speed. So, um, it's also worth noting that if you started any of these engines with these butterfly valves closed, it would end up stalling the engine. So most of the time, and I'll get into this a little bit when I start to talk about PT-109, most of the time um, the tactic in the Pacific was to have these butterfly valves all closed and then be only running on the center engine with the two wing engines in neutral so that he um, the motor Mac would sh quickly shift them into a head if they needed to get away. This comes into play at some uh, in, later in this lecture. So I'm going to talk quickly about the armament aboard PT boats. Almost all of them left the production line with the standard armament package. Um, oftentimes as the war went on and technology advanced, there would be modification of these, of the, the weapons and the armament aboard. However, um, most of the PT boats were actually modified in the field once they reached combat areas by their crews and by their skippers if they were able to scrounge up um, different weapons and weapons that would be able to be added on or changed or removed. So for the original Elko vessels, the armament aboard included four Mark VIII torpedoes, one, two, three, four here. Um, they would be carried aboard in heavy steel steel tubes. They also had uh, four 50 caliber Browning machine guns that would be sent in t set in twin mounts. These were sort of situated kitty corner to each other, sort of opposite each other. Um, they would also have a 20 millimeter and a, sorry, a 20 millimeter or a 40 millimeter machine gun mounted um, aboard on a hand elevated mount. 
They had two uh, 30 30 caliber Lewis machine guns that would be mounted in a small swivel on the bow and then one set on the starboard side of the cockpit brought out. Um, They would be stowed below decks and then brought out and only really only brought out when um, combat was imminent. They wouldn't be permanently mounted. So while each boat, each boat also carried a selection of small arms, including uh, 45 caliber pistols, rifles, submachine guns, and the occasional hand grenade. Interestingly, from oral histories, the hand grenades were popularly used by the cooks aboard for fishing um, and not actually used during combat as much. The Higgins came with a very similar armament package. You've got the four torpedoes here, but their um, 50 caliber Browning machine guns were actually set almost directly opposite each other. And this actually cut down on um, the sort of the the, the ability, the, the range of these machine guns because these um, on the Elko, they had all of this space to work with. Now these guys could really only work with, you know, this space. They couldn't. They really couldn't go in that direction. Anyways, so it was kind of an interesting way that they've positioned those. But the Elko gunners preferred the way that their um, machine guns were set in those twin mounts rather than the Higgins. So <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about the torpedoes as well. Um, unfortunately, the torpedoes that were carried by PT boats uh, were not good. The Mark 8 torpedoes in particular, they were a carryover from World War I. These Mark 8 torpedoes were heavy and slow. They carried a relatively small warhead. And actually, in post-World War II tests, it was found that 63% of these Mark 8 torpedoes were actually defective and they would not detonate as a result of a direct hit. They needed to hit their target at an angle actually before exploding. So these these were really ineffective and out and desperately outdated weapons. And throughout the war, PT boats fired hundreds of these torpedoes and only very rarely hit anything. To aim and fire them, it was really a matter of aiming the boat in a almost direct collision course with their target, essentially a perpendicular angle. On Elko boats, the torpedoes could be cranked out to a firing position. They had turntables with a hand-operated crank. When action was imminent, the forward torpedoes would be cranked out to eight and a half degrees um, overboard, and then the rear tubes would be cranked out to 12 and a half degrees. Higgins boats did not have um, the ability to to crank the torpedoes out. They were um, launched from a fixed position, which made the angle of the vessel even more important. The torpedoes were fired by black powder charges that were ignited by compressed air canisters situated on top of the launching tubes. They, um, these compressed air canisters, uh, were, and the black powder charges were set off by a switch on the bridge by the skipper. In the event of a malfunction, a torpedo man could hit the tube's manual percussion cap with a wooden mallet to launch the torpedoes, um, uh, which it, it did quite, it, this, these malfunctions happened quite often, so there always needed to be somebody ready um, quite close to the torpedo tube with this wooden mallet to uh, deploy at any, at any time. Um, now, the standard practice of the skipper was to actually hold back on the throttles at the moment of launch, which helped to allow the torpedoes to clear the tubes and, of course, the deck of the vessel. One through four torpedoes could be launched at the same time, but it was really standard practice to fire the two aft tubes followed by the forward tubes. And in the case that the boat had to move quickly out of the area, it was actually, uh, the boat was at a better trim without those aft torpedoes. Thus, they could move faster and get out of the way of the enemy. So I I talked a little bit about um, that hand crank here, this image on the left, you can see um, uh, is is how it is operated by the torpedo men aboard. Now, while the torpedoes theoretically left their tubes at a speed of 40 feet per second, um, they would hypothetically clear the deck by five and a half feet, which is really not much. I'm five foot three. I'm a little bit less than five and a half feet. Um, I'm I'm not a very tall person. So you can imagine that clearing the deck by five and a half feet wasn't without its problems. Misfires often occurred of these torpedoes that would cause the torpedo to bang its veins against the deck as it uh, uh, was actually fired. Um, This would result in an erratic run or worse, if the torpedo failed to leave their tube at all, the torpedo motor would be on a hot run. 
Um, and they really, tor the, the, the guys aboard really only had a few seconds before these torpedo motors um, disintegrated. And while there was no danger of the warhead itself exploding, the motors would explode and this would shoot fragments of shrapnel about the tube and very oftentimes about the deck. So once fired, the preset gyro angles within the um, torpedo, the um, the gyro would bring the torpedo back on course, but complicating matters even more for this, if the torpedo was, was not launched on an even keel relative to the surface, the guidance gyroscope would actually tumble and then fail. So while the torpedoes could travel at 27 knots, this was a 3,150 pound torpedo, so it would move relatively slow. So you can really imagine that it took really great luck or skill to hit anything at all, never mind anything moving. So to do any real or actual damage with these, I'm going to be frank, horrible weapons, PT boats needed to sneak in dangerously close to their target, often within about a thousand yards, which would place them directly in the line of their enemies. And you can, uh, their enemies were usually much larger and much better armed vessels like destroyers, cruisers. So overall, not a great situation. So the problem of these Mark 8 torpedoes was well known by the Navy, and there were many um, solutions studied for PT boat use. The solution that they found was the Mark 13 aircraft torpedo. Um, that turned out to be the best uh, sort of uh, solution for them. So in order to launch these torpedoes, the Mark 13 torpedo torpedoes, a manually operated handle that was attached to a series of pulleys would start the gyro compass in the Mark 13. And then a moment later, the torpedo would slide down off a set of greased skids or racks, uh, and it would land casually over the side of the PT boat and then start on its journey towards the enemy. So the skids were attached to a simple two-piece rack here. You can see that on the right-hand image. These were very similar to those that held depth charges, and the PT boats also had depth charges aboard. So it was kind of an easy way for PT boat crews to um, modify um, their the awful Mark VIII torpedoes and use something that worked better. So after many, many tests, reloads, and then relaunches, orders were sent by the Navy to install these racks on many PT squadron boats. So a few more, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the armament ab aboard these little vessels. They could also include the 50 caliber twin Browning machine gun that's in the upper left, um, as well as a 20 millimeter Orlikin. Um, they also were able to have 40 millimeter Bofors or a 37 millimeter um, cannon as well. Uh, so in later years of the war, many of the PT boats had two or even all of their torpedo racks or tubes removed, which allowed them to carry more automatic weapons on deck, essentially acting as gunboats and barge busters. So later modifications also included the addition of that 37 millimeter cannon. Um, this was placed on a special mount here on the bottom right hand image. It was placed on a special mount. Um, placed on the center line forward, um, forward of the um, of the pilot house. This replaced the lighter 20 millimeter. And now, as more PTs were used as gunboats in the later years, the 40 millimeter Beaufort cannons were being installed on the boats, um, and these were a lot heavier than the 20 millimeter or the 37 millimeter. But they were able to be installed because they did not have those heavy torpedoes anymore. So it allowed for a little bit more weight to be put aboard. So other modifications to PT boats included the addition of an 81 millimeter mortar, sometimes a, uh, and sometimes the addition of Mark 50 rocket launchers as well. Um, so they were really, they were really capable of, um, you know, adding and subtracting whatever type of armament they needed or whatever type of armament they could find at that point. So while not necessarily a weapon, an item of great use to PT boaters was the smoke generator aboard. And this was used often to cover activities such as landings, retreats, as well as protection of other boats. On the left-hand image here, you can see a PT boat that is laying a smoke screen around a troop transport that is landing off the Italian coast. 
Lastly, um, and I had just discussed depth charges, the last thing that PT boats carried were depth charges. They were usually equipped with four or more, and they were originally used as anti-submarine weapons, but were more often used to discourage pursuing destroyers. They would be dropped overboard at a shallow setting, and then for those pursuing destroyers, depth charges could do some decent damage to them. And in the right-hand image here, you can see that officers, um, this is from a, uh, um, a training training at Melville, Rhode Island, officers are being trained in the use of these depth charges. I like this image a lot because you can see that there's um, you know a lot of education going on for these officers. They're learning real hands-on, which is great. So, um, I'm going to talk, speaking of those officers, I'm going to talk a little bit about who the PT boaters were. So on the left-hand image is the PT insignia shoulder patch worn by enlisted PT boaters. This was worn right above their enlisted rating badge. So the crew of a PT boat usually consisted of two officers and eight enlisted men. However, some crews had more than that, uh, and PT boats could really have at an absolute maximum 16 men, but on average they had about two to three officers and eight enlisted men. The men on board usually included a mixture of the following, a torpedo man, a gunner's mate, a quartermaster, a radio man, three engineers, motor machinist mates, or motor max, what I've been calling them and what they were more colloquially, colloquially known as. They also had one seaman as well as a seaman first class aboard. So the men in PT crews could do many jobs as well. So often the cooks could also be the gunners. Um, the quartermaster could also be the cook. Um, and this is really because the size of the PT crew left little room for replacement if someone was lost. So everyone kind of had to know how to do many jobs. That being said, though, PT boat crews were never really known for their stern discipline when it came to their uniforms. They were often much more casual, casually dressed. Um, in the Pacific, they were often found in skivvy shorts or dungarees around camp. They were much more laid back in terms of following rank and rate than the crews on much larger ships. And I think this really comes down to the nature of being on a very small crew compared to a very large vessel like a battleship or an aircraft carrier where you have multiple division and a much more separate division of um, officers and enlisted. So PT boat crews were really small, so they had to be a very cohesive team, which would kind of lead in many cases to a little bit more of a casual attitude or casual air about, about the boat. So established on March 16th, 1942, the Motor Torpedo Boat Squadron Training Center, Center or MTB STC at Melville, Rhode Island. This was the training center that built squadrons around efficient officers and created well-trained crews with knowledge gained by experience. So every single man that served on a PT boat, all officers, all enlisted men had to go through training at Melville. PT boaters spent usually two to five months training on PT boats in Melville. And so this, this image here is the first class of PT officers and enlisted men to graduate from Melville's PT Boat Training Center. Now, Melville consisted of a few lines of Quonset Hut classrooms, as well as machine shops, mess halls, and of course, harbor front access for the crews to train on the PT boats. Fun fact, if you visit Melville, Rhode Island today, there's a restaurant there called the Gulfstream Bar and Grill. This restaurant is actually housed in one of the original Quonset huts where the PT boats trained, sorry, PT, PT crews trained. They also have delicious food. So it's worth checking out if you're down near the Newport, Rhode Island area. So training for the men at Melville consisted of classes as well as instruction on navigation, engineering, communication, as well as gunnery. Gunnery training included the recognition as well as stripping, cleaning, and assembling of weapons. Melville also had repair training facilities, including cranes for lifting boats into dry docks for repair, as well as facilities for structure, structural repair. Now, the training at Melville was grueling, but it was incredibly in-depth. The men would train until they could literally do their jobs while half asleep. So here's some extra photographs of training at Melville. The image on the left is a group of officers uh, training in gunnery and at the bridge controls on PT-66. 
This is an Elko boat. On the right hand image is, a, is an officer, a chief petty officer and enlisted men training on the use of depth charges. So at the height of World War II, Melville had 28 PT boats in, for PT crews to learn and to train aboard. So just to clarify a little bit too, um, I'm probably gonna be talking about this a little bit later, squadrons, that the squadrons themselves were actually the commissioned units and not the boats individually. The boats were actually placed in service in their squadrons. And so this policy helped to centralize the administration of this and also avoided the likelihood of confusion if each boat had been a separate administrative unit that would have been absolutely bananas. The squadrons consisted of, on average, about 12 boats per squadron. Some of the squadrons had more than 12. So, for example, Squadron 15, uh, which operated in the Mediterranean, had 18 boats in the squadron. Some, some had less, but the average was really about 12 boats per squadron. Uh, one of the most recognizable things of PT boat squadrons are their insignia. Some of them were very creative. Others were a little bit macabre. Others were um, made to look very intimidating. I really love Squadron 4, which I'm sure you've probably guessed it. This was the Melville Training Squadron. I really love it because you can see the Professor Mosquito there train, training the little baby mosquitoes with the little PT boat in a bathtub. Um, it's very clever. Um, especially because they, they did like the sort of, um, you know, the mosquito boat moniker as well. It's pretty cute. Uh, and it just makes me laugh every time I see it. So in the Pacific, PT bases were very basic. They were functional, but most importantly, they're mobile. The bases themselves were a combination of personnel as well as materials that were needed for all of the PT boat needs. Bases included workshops, repair shops, supplies, storage, vehicles, boats, office equipment, housing, as well as messing facilities for the personnel needed to keep these PT boats running. They also had defensive ordnance, communication facilities, as well as a separate power plant and probably water facilities. Each base had itself a commanding officer and a typical PT base could contain around 250 men. And this included enlisted and officers. So I do also wanna say that the Pacific, while beautiful, um, was not a Pacific holiday that we all would imagine. It was rich with cockroaches, rats, lizards, sand crabs, black flies, mosquitoes, uh, which also brought malaria, uh, dengue fever, dysentery, trench foot, tropical fever, elephantiitis, and periods of unrelenting tropical rainfall. So the crews, uh, while at base, because of the sort of overwhelming heat and humidity here, would often sleep aboard their boats. And I'm sure you can imagine they would be really drenched in sweat from that heat and humidity of these tropical islands. So it really wasn't a fun time for any of them. Of course, war never is, but it wasn't a Pacific holiday by any means. So speaking of, food for PT boaters was mostly canned food like Spam, Vienna sausages. There was also powdered eggs, baked beans, corned beef. So you can also probably imagine that food got very monotonous and very fast. They would also occasionally eat aircraft emergency rations in order to change things up a little bit. And I'm sure you can also imagine that coffee and cigarettes were staples, yet luxuries for these guys. Ice cream was probably the biggest treat that everybody craved as well and was made from powder. When it could be fined, the PT boat crews would store it in, their, in the little freezer they had aboard and their galley. For entertainment at these bases and on board, men would play cards. They would very often write letters home. They would often listen to the radio as well. Aspirin was something that was used frequently for the heat and PT boaters were very often given vitamin A pills in order to help improve their night vision. So these, um, these bases were really operating at a very advanced location. The, these were very advanced bases in terms of the, um, you know, the, 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 the gains and losses at war. They were usually a step ahead than the rest of the fleet, 
Um, and that would include they were a step ahead from maintenance and repair centers. So PT boats in battle, despite being capable of high speeds and quick maneuverability, they were really not the most efficient vessels. And a major problem for them was their engines. Their Packard engines were meant to be overhauled or replaced every 500 hours of use. And this was really not easily possible, especially in the Pacific, uh, because they did have very limited facilities. They were operating at these very advanced bases with the repair centers way back with the rest of the fleet. So fresh engines were really in short supply. Um, even with the very hardworking motor max that would keep their engines in shape, there's a great image here on the right hand side. Um, these engines were unfortunately constantly quitting in the middle of action. Engine troubles would decrease the running efficiency, and they would also force the skippers to reduce their speeds, which was very much not ideal when you're trying to run away after firing your torpedoes at an enemy. Additionally, like any high performance engine, if anyone has a, a you know, a, a really high performing car, these engines were known to fail at the most inopportune times. Whoever Murphy is and his law, he really was involved in a lot of those Packard engines. Another problem of these PT boats was the constant fouling of the bottoms and the props. The Pacific Theater, I'm sure you can imagine, was the worst for this. It was really hard to come across adequate hull maintenance facilities, and it was very much not uncommon at all to see these boats with a beard of green algae growing beneath the waterline, nor was it uncommon for PT boats to literally become so waterlogged that they needed a period of drying out. Another problem with PT boats is that they are not like larger vessels in the fleet. They're not like a cruiser or a battleship or an aircraft carrier or a destroyer. They could not remain self-sufficient for long periods of time. They do not have endless storerooms full of food, supplies, damage control materials, replacement parts. I could keep going on. They required constant maintenance and resupply. So they really did have to operate out of a base or a tender, basically a mothership. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk a little bit about PT boats specifically in the, in the Pacific theater. Uh, we don't have enough time today to get into the Aleutians or the Mediterranean, but so I'm going to focus specifically on the Pacific because it does set up a lot of the PT-109 story. So PT boats in the Pacific were intended to supplement the air and naval power by harassing Japanese supply ships. They would also serve as patrol and rescue boats and hopefully sink a few Japanese ships while they're at it. So the Tokyo Express, which was so-called by the Americans, was a method that the Japanese used to deliver personnel, supplies, and equipment to and between the Solomon Islands. As the Japanese moved between these islands, they relied heavily on shallow draft barges running mostly at night. So the job of PT boats in this area was to disrupt the Tokyo Express by sinking those barges, thus disrupting the supply chain. Without supplies, the Japanese would not be able to replace uh, their ammunition, their fuel, and of course their personnel. These barges that they used were nimble and they had very shallow drafts, which allowed them to access areas that were harder for um, uh, larger draft vessels to reach. This also meant... Remember what I said about those Mark 8 torpedoes? This also meant that these shallow draft barges were really hard to hit because they were so shallow. They rode really low to the waterline as well because they were barges, which made them even harder to spot. So the PTs really had a difficult job on their hands. Now, because of American air aircraft flying out of Henderson Field on Guadalcanal attacking during the day, these barges and supply ships had to travel at night and they traveled with all of their lights off except for signal lights. So again, PT boats had a really tough job because they had to find these shallow draft boats that also rode really low to the waterline in basic darkness. So the Japanese also used fast moving destroyers on the Tokyo Express as well. The theory is that they would, they would be able to outrun uh, the aircraft um, they would be out of range from the aircraft flying out of Henderson Field. They would also run at night. 
Now, because of their speed, the destroyers were also quite harder for PT boaters to spot. So heading out for evening patrols, most PT boats would separate into groups or divisions. So each squadron would separate into about three to four divisions within each squadron, uh, usually about three to four boats per division. They would head out for their designated sectors where theoretically anything that moved was fair game to PT boaters. Nighttime in the Pacific though brought a whole new level of problems though. So I'd mentioned those, um, those mufflers that would basically take all of the exhaust and force it underwater. We also have three propellers underneath the PT boat. So the propellers and the exhaust would actually churn up microscopic sea life, which created um, flowing phosphorescent wakes behind them. The Japanese float planes um, would follow these paths of phosphorescent uh, wakes and then bomb the PT boats based on those phosphorescent wakes. This also alerted other Japanese air and surface craft to attack the boats as well. Um, now these phosphorescent wakes were really sort of the bane of a PT boat's existence and a PT boat skipper described these phosphorescent wakes as, and if there's children in the, in the audience, put your earmuffs on, a PT boat skipper described these phosphorescent wakes as a line, long shining arrow pointed right up our ass. Okay, kids, you can take your earmuffs back off. Okay. Air attacks by Japanese aircraft at night were frequent and very sudden, and they also were during the day. They really strained the nerves of PT crews immensely, and they were already in an incredibly stressful, hot, awful, terrifying environment. And because of these air attacks, skippers usually kept those butterfly valves closed, uh, forcing the exhaust down below the water. This helped them to hear better, to hear those imminent air attacks better, and they usually only kept that one engine, that center engine, engaged in ahead, um, while the other two were kept in neutral, and this was also in order to be quieter. And it was usually the center engine that was kept engaged as the propeller was a little bit lower, and the theory is that it would churn up less phosphorescent the lower in the water it is. So they they really had it they really had it in uh, for them. Unfortunately, it was a really tough job to be a PT boater in the Pacific. So now that we've sort of set the stage for this, we're going to jump back in time again to the summer of 1941, and we're leaving the Pacific. We're going to Martha's Vineyard in this time and space jump. So during the summer of 1941, John F. Kennedy sailed his boat Victura from Hyannis Port to Martha's Vineyard. And it was there in Edgar Town that he saw a very strange sight. He saw a PT boat and it was on exhibit by the US Navy in order to recruit new sailors, new PT boat crews. And it was very, it, 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 apparently from his, um, from notes, it was the trim lines and the scrappy look of the PT boat that fascinated him. He learned also that the PT boat crews and fleet offered naval officers the opportunity to command their own vessel at an early stage in their career, which was a very attractive draw to a man who loved being on the water and handling small craft. So in September of 1941, JFK was appointed as an ensign in the U.S. Naval Reserve and was put on staff with the Office of Naval Intelligence at the Pentagon in October of that year. By July of 1942, JFK was in Naval Officer Training School at Northwestern University, and it was at Northwestern while Lieutenant Commander John D. Bulkley and Lieutenant John Harley were looking for PT officer candidates. JFK was selected by them. In later interviews, Harley recalled that the reasons JFK was selected by them for this was because of his sailing background, his exemplary education at Harvard, and his stellar marks at Naval Officer Training School, as well as his leadership-like demeanor. He was pretty soon recommended for the eight-week PT officer training program at Melville, Rhode Island. Extra points to everybody if they can spot where he is in this picture. Kennedy did very well at Melville. It was a day trip away from his family's summer home in Hyannisport, and he was really a natural on a PT boat. He entered Melville as an ensign, and he graduated from the training school at Melvin, Melville as a Lieutenant JG, or a Lieutenant Junior Grade, in September of 1942. 
After his graduation, he was ordered to stay on at Melville as an instructor. Um, and during his time as an instructor there, he was reported to be a very effective instructor. He commanded PT-101 during his time at Melville, which was a 78-foot training boat that was built by Hawkins. JFK found out that he was going to be sent to Squadron 14, which at that point was stationed in Jacksonville, Florida. And from there, Squadron 14 would go on to Central America to guard the Panama Canal. He apparently wasn't happy with this because he sent a formal change of assignment request to, quote, be reassigned to a motor torpedo squadron now operating in the South Pacific. On the 20th of February of 1943, this request was approved and he was ordered to proceed to uh, Squadron 2, which was at that point was operating in the Solomon Islands. He departed San Francisco on the 15th of March on the USS Rochambeau. And by the end of March, he arrived at Espiritu Santo and then headed on to the PT base located at Tulagi. His journey there was long and was not without attacks by the Japanese. Um, and uh, there's some great reading on that. I'll get to my recommended reading later if you want to read about that in detail. So on April 25th, 1943, JFK officially took command of PT-109. PT-109 was built at Elko's plant in Bayonne, New Jersey in June of 1942. It was later outfitted at Brooklyn Navy Yard in New York City, just up the, uh, just up the river from Bayonne. PT-109 was one of the first 80-foot uh, vessels built by Elko. She had a 20-millimeter Orlikon mounted at the rear, two twin 50-caliber machine guns in turrets, and then four Mark 8 torpedo tubes, as well as 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 an assortment of small arms. Kennedy managed to secure and add a 37 millimeter anti-tank gun for PT-109. And they were slightly, he found that they were slightly awkward weapons and were kind of a chore to mount and load. But this 37 millimeter anti-tank gun really packed a real wallop. It was an anti-tank gun. So it packed much more of a wallop than any of the other armament and weapons aboard. So in order to make room for this, they had to remove PT-109's life raft. Remember that fact for a little bit later. This image that you see here is from August of 1942. It's part of a series of photographs by the U.S. Navy that includes PTs 105 through 110. And it, uh, it was taken by the U.S. Navy in order to show the proper way to stow, to stow a PT boat aboard a Liberty ship. There are other supplies visible aboard, um, such as trucks, uh, but it's really a great view of PT-109 in her sort of fresh state heading out to the Pacific. So <clears throat> this is a popular photograph of the crew of PT-109. Um, however, this is not the same crew that was aboard the sort of fateful evening of PT-109. Uh, the crew, as of August 2nd, 1943, the commanding officer was Lieutenant J.G. John F. Kennedy. I'm going to get my laser pointer out here again. That's him right there. I'm sure you guys all knew that. The executive officer aboard was Ensign Leonard Lenny J. Tom. He's in the bottom far right of this image here. That's him right there. Ensign George Barney H.R. Ross, who is not pictured in this image, he was the lookout, the gunner, and he interestingly was not part of the permanent crew. Ross was a man without a boat at this time. Um, he had been the executive officer on PT-166, which had been accidentally sunk by friendly fire by American B-25s just 10 days before August 2nd, 1943. Kennedy asked Ross to join the crew for their patrol on August 2nd as they were short one man that evening. Now, again, Ross is not pictured. For the enlisted men aboard, there was torpedoman second class Andrew Jackson Kirksey. That's him right here. Torpedoman second class Raymond L. Starkey was aboard. He is not pictured. Radioman second class John Edward McGuire. Is this guy here, that beautiful smile. Gunner's mate, second class, Charles Bucky A. Harris. That's him there, adorable smile. Seaman first class, Raymond Albert. He was a gunner, he is not pictured. Seaman first class, who is also the quartermaster, Edgar Maurer. 
Also an adorable smile. He looks so excited to have that picture taken. Motor Mac, uh, the Motor Macs aboard were William N. Johnson, sorry, Johnston, Patrick Henry McMahon, Gerard Emile Zinser, and he Harold William Marney. None of them are pictured in this image here. So with PT-109, JFK was a very responsible leader. And in the case of PT-109 itself, they were reported to be a very, very, very strong crew. Like I had mentioned a few minutes before, small crews like this really had to operate as a well-oiled machine and they all had to look out for each other. And from all reports, they were a very great team. So PT-109 and her crew were operating out of the very edge of the front line of the Pacific War by August of 1943. Um, at a, they were operating out of their base in Rendova. That's here where that red star is. Now across from Rendova is Munda Point. This was a Japanese island that was still under constant U.S. air and naval bombardment. At this point on the island itself, the U.S. 43rd Infantry Division and the 9th Marine Battalion were locked in a very fierce stalemate with Japanese forces. Around mid-afternoon of August 1st, a message came through um, to Rendova to get the maximum number of PT boats to the Blackett Strait. This was a stretch of water that's immediately south and west of Kolombangara. That's here. Here's the Blackett Strait. So they were, the, the PT boats were to strike on the Tokyo Express, with the Tokyo Express's route being the green dotted line. Rendova's base commander, who is Commander Thomas Warfield, briefed all of his boat commanders on this plan. Kennedy's 109 was assigned to a four boat group or division with PTs 157, 159, and 162. The division here was led by PT-159, and, and they were dubbed Division B. They would occupy the northwesternmost patrol region um, in the Vela Gulf, off of a point on the very western point of Kalambangara. Next to them was Division A. You can see the letter A right there. They were assigned to patrol the Blackett Strait. Division R, which was uh, three boats in the division, was also assigned to the Blackett Strait, but the very eastern part of the Blackett Strait. And then Division C was sent to patrol the Ferguson Passage as a reserve. So at this point, there were only four boats in all of the division that had radar equipment. Uh, radar was still very primitive at this point. Each of these four boats was assigned as the leader of the division, which was why PT-159 was the leader in the division, because it was the one in Kennedy's division that had radar. PT-109 did not. So while the plan for this patrol and strike on the Tokyo Express, if they found them, was good in theory, there was no discussion of contingency plans should a boat be lost, damaged, or sunk. They also had not discussed search and rescue procedures should any of the men be lost at sea. Hmm, interesting. So in reality, they were in not a very good situation. There were essentially 15 boats scattered about this area in the black of night under radio silence and less in dire emergencies and most of the boats without radar. They were essentially operating on their own. Making it even worse, the evening was moonless. So there wasn't even a moon to help them out. It was pitch dark um, and all of the boats were blacked out. They could not see each other without risking exposure. Um, from later reports, Ensign George Ross remembered, quote, it was as dark as if you were in a closet with the door shut. There was no moon, no stars. So by midnight, now August 2nd, PT-109 and her crew was in position off Vanga Point, which was northwest of Kalambangara Island. They were there waiting to ambush the Tokyo Express. PT-109 was one of the two most westernmost, one of the two westernmost boats in a six mile long 15 boat formation. PT-159's radar screen 
picked up four blips that were bearing south off the Colum Vagara coast. PT-159 Skipper, who was L Lieutenant Hank Brantingham, he assumed that these objects were barges and left with PT-157 to attack. However, instead of barges, these four craft were Japanese destroyers who quickly spotted both PT-159 and PT-157 and opened fire. PT-157 launched all four of their torpedoes. Two of them misfired and two of them missed their target. Meanwhile, on PT-159, the, lub the lubricating oil in one of the tubes caught fire uh, and was burning and was now serving as a literal target, a beacon for those Japanese destroyers. PT-159 laid down a smoke screen and both PTs withdrew hastily into the darkness. Both PT-109 and 162, the other two boats in their, in their division, had no details of this encounter besides spotty radio. Um, and they were told to keep radio chatter at an absolute minimum, to keep radio silence. Um, and with periodic burst-like chatter coming through the radio, they had no visual in sight either. There was, there was really little way for them to know what was going on. They were virtually separated and out of visual range. Complicating matters even more, Commander Warfield back at base in Rendova ordered PT-159, the only boat in, her, in their division with radar, back to base. So li this left the other boats even more blind than they were before. Radio operator, the radio operator ab aboard, John McGuire, lady, later recalled of that evening, we never got any word that there were destroyers in our area. There were no instructions at all, and once we got out there, we never heard from anybody. The skipper of PT-105, Lieutenant Jack Kersey, later recalled of this evening, there was more confusion in that battle than at any time in the history of PT boats. We had 15 boats. Everybody attacked on their own. Nobody communicated anything of any value. So at this point, PTs 109 and 162 moved away from Kalim Bangara towards the island of Gizo. It's right here, Gizo and Kalim Bangara is here. So they were getting a little bit closer to Gizo. <clears throat> so unscathed by any of the American PT boats in the area, the Tokyo Express arrived at Villa Plantation, their Villa Plantation garrison on Kalim Bangara at 12.30 a.m. They efficiently and quickly unloaded all of their supplies and cargo, including 900 Japanese soldiers who were disembarking here to help reinforce their island outpost. At 2 a.m., all four of those Japanese destroyers, they were named the Amagiri, the Shiguri, the Arashi, and the Hagakazi, they headed back out for their return voyage to Rabao, which was an island much further north here. The destroyer Amagiri was acting as a scout ahead of the three other destroyers. So by this point, P uh, PTs 109 and 162 had moved north of Kalambangara towards the island of Vela La Vela. So they were probably around this area. At 2 a.m., they linked up with PT-169, a boat from a completely different division that was also scattered from the rest of their division. They, uh, they all drifted together, but in the really dark, dark night, they had trouble staying together. So they all agreed to link up with the other remaining PTs in the rest of the divisions. And once they all moved back into position in the correct patrol area, they quickly lost visual contact in the darkness. So it was at this point that Kennedy was at the wheel, was at the helm, with Radioman McGuire standing right next to him. Marnie was in the forward gun turret. Ross was on, was on lookout on the forward deck near the 37 millimeter anti-tank gun. McMahon was at his post in the engine room. Albert was at the machine gun on the port side of the boat. Starkey was a lookout in the rear gun turret, and Zinser was on deck, having just come off watch from the engine room. There were four men who were not up and alert because they were not on watch at that point, including Ensign Tom, who was reclined on the left side of the deck. Harris, Johnston, and Kirksey were all off duty, relaxing, or dozing on deck. 
At this point, only one of the engines was engaged. That was the central engine. The other two were idling in order to cut down on the wake and the phosphorescence. Uh, again, this was common practice. Um, it was also a tactic that Kennedy was using in order to help hear the possible approach of aircraft. And so we can only assume at this point that it's very, very likely that all of the butterfly valves were closed on all three engines, which was forcing the exhaust downwards and under the water in order to make less noise. So Marnie in the forward 50 caliber gun turret uh, yelled out a warning that there was a ship ahead. Kennedy had less than 20 seconds to react before these two vessels collided. The ship ahead was the Japanese destroyer Amagiri, and it was speeding towards PT-109's right side at 34 knots. It was bearing down on them and bearing down on them fast. Kennedy later recalled, as soon as I decided it was a destroyer, I turned to make a torpedo run. Interestingly, though, to do this in just a few seconds, Kennedy would have had to engage the two idling engines, which meant sending down the order to the engine room, to the engine telegraph, then the motor mac would have to change the gears. Um, he would also have to rotate the boat to starboard by about 30 degrees into firing position and then simultaneously command the crew aboard to line up the shot. They had less than a thousand yards to do this and only a handful of seconds. In order to get the two wing, in, wing engines in gear, like I said, he would have had to have send. He would have had to have had send sent a signal to the engine room and hope that the motor mac down below could move fast or was even paying attention. No one knows if he sent that signal down to the engine room. His only control over the vessel, Kennedy's only control over the vessel at that point, in order to get P two one hundred nine out of the way was the throttle for that central engine because it was the only one that was in gear for ahead. So there was really no time to move out of the way. So um, from later uh, recollections, McGuire said that the ship was, again, kids, if you have kids in the audience, earmuffs, McGuire said that the ship was hauling ass for them for a direct collision. Okay, ear earmuffs can come off now. Like a predator closing in on its prey, Amagiri moved in on PT-109. Ross later recalled that the destroyer was making such a hard and sharp turn to ram PT-109 that its mast was at a 45 degree angle to the water. The destroyer was turning into them in order to ram them, and this was something that was later confirmed by the skipper of Amagiri in post-war interviews. Kennedy later recalled that he turned into us going like hell. The sharp steel bow of Amagiri smashed into the wooden hull of PT-109, piercing near the front starboard torpedo tube, very close to the cockpit. The destroyer plowed straight through PT-109 diagonally, cracking open the boat. Much of the boat's stern quickly sank below the surface. Marnie and Kirksey vanished in this collision. Marnie was in the starboard side gun turret, which was directly in the destroyer's path, and Kirksey was laying down on the aft starboard side of the boat, also directly in the destroyer's path, and no trace of either man was ever found. A fireball quickly exploded from PT-109 that was fed by thousands of gallons of high test, high octane aviation fuel that was now spilling into the water. Kennedy and Maurer remained on the wreckage that had stayed afloat. McGuire had been thrown out of the cockpit onto the day room um, and then into the ocean, but he managed to climb back up onto the wreckage. The only person that was below decks at the time was McMahon. He was down in the engine room. The destroyer sliced directly directly through his position in the engine room, which forced him against the boat's auxiliary generator. Initially, um, he later recalled that he had thought that they had hit a rock and he looked up through a hatch in the forward section of the engine room and saw that huge fireball. Upon exploding, the stern of the boat uh, was still sinking, uh, which pulled McMahon down with it um, and seawater and flames from the exploding gas tanks quickly covered him. He was very likely dragged underwater by the propellers of uh, the destroyer Amagiri, but luckily for him, he surfaced nearly 500 yards away. 
Unluckily for him, though, he surfaced right into a gasoline fire. His face, his face, chest, and limbs were very badly burnt. Ross, who was at the bow of the boat, was choking and soon passed out from that gas from those gasoline fumes. Johnston was flipped overboard during the collision, and like McMahon, he was dragged under by the destroyer's propeller and pushed towards the bottom. And again, like McMahon, he surfaced after nearly drowning, but surfaced in a pool of burning gasoline, inhaling those awful fumes and soon beginning to faint. Harris had dove into the water upon impact, but something struck him, which propelled him sideways and badly injured his leg. His life jacket brought him up, his K-Pok life jacket brought him up, but his leg was completely numb. Zinser's arm and chest were badly burnt as well. He fell unconscious for about 10 to 15 minutes. Starkey tumbled into the water as well and quickly passed out from those horrible gasoline fumes. A few thousand yards away from PT-109 was PT-169. The skipper, who is Lieutenant Potter, spotted the collision and the flames. PT-169 PT fired two of her torpedoes at Amagiri and then circled away towards Gizo. Potter later asserted that he returned to the location to look for PT-109, but did not find a single trace. PT-162 was also somewhat nearby, but did not make a search attempt, and both PTs-162 and 169 headed back to base at Rendova by 4 a.m. as the safety of nighttime's darkness was beginning to wane, the sun was starting to come up. All of the 11 survivors of PT-109 at this point were alone at sea with no food, no water, no radio, no life raft, and no medical supplies. Three men were very badly burnt. The salt water was probably stinging them with absolute blinding pain on those horrible burns. Most of the men had passed out or, or were in the process of passing out from gasoline fumes, or some of them were still actively choking on these fumes or were completely delirious. It's also very likely that there were sharks below them that might have been circling, but um, we can't be sure. Harris uh, was about 100 yards away from the wreckage with McMahon. McMahon was in really bad shape at this point. He had second and third degree burns on most of his upper body. He was suffering from shock by this point. Harris had his leg badly hurt, and he was he called to the men aboard the wreckage. Kennedy swam out to meet them. He towed McMahon back by the strap of his life jacket while simultaneously encouraging Harris to swim, who was, and it was a bit of a late laborious process because of his injured leg. So this is about nearly three hours after the collision and after many different searches by Kennedy and the rest of the men aboard the, the wreckage, all 11 survivors managed to gather on and around the floating remains of PT-109. They drifted throughout the night in the direction of the Ferguson Passage. This graphic here shows a majority of their drifting and directions that they headed in. <clears throat> so the men had very little choice of where they could go. They were three miles to the northeast of, um, sorry, three miles to the northeast of them was Kalimbangara Island, which at that point had 10,000 Japanese troops. A mile southwest of them was Gizo Island, which was known to have 200 Japanese troops. Rendova, the closest PT base and the closest land controlled by the Allies, was 38 miles to the south. So as the hours passed, they also saw no aircraft and no vessels coming to look for them. So they had to find land. They had to get somewhere. There was a small island just east of Gizo that was visible to them, and it was deemed to be not large enough to be of practical use by the Japanese. So it was called Kosolo, meaning gods of paradise by Solomon Islanders, but it had also been dubbed Plum Pudding Island by English colonial authorities who were clearly homesick for their traditional English dessert. So all 11 men uh, swam to the island Kennedy towed McMahon famously by gripping the strap of his life jacket in his teeth, 
The other men had fashioned an improvised flotation device that they made from some of the planks salvaged from the 37 millimeter anti-tank mount. They kicked and paddled themselves towards the island. This was a three and a half mile swim over open water in enemy territory in broad daylight with currents and waves to battle. So after nearly four hours, Kennedy, with McMahon still in tow in his teeth, arrived at Plum Pudding Island, and the other nine men arrived shortly after. They had no food, no fresh water. The few trees that were on the islands that had coconuts, um, the coconuts were either unripe or completely rotten, making matters worse, complicating things even further and making matters even worse. PT Boat offers dirt officers during those eight weeks in Melville, eight to um, five months at Melville, they received very little, if any, specialized survival training. So we have this sort of novice crew that's never been trained on how to help survive in the middle of the Pacific, in the middle of the Pacific on a basically deserted island. So Kennedy took action in order to save his men. The plan of his was to swim out into the Ferguson Passage under the cover of darkness later that day, to try and hail a passing PT boat with the ship's lantern that they still had. After only a few hours rest, he took his life jacket, a 38 caliber revolver, and the battery-powered lantern and struck out eastward towards the nearest island, heading towards the passage. Eventually swimming out in into the deeper waters of the passage, he listened for the PT boat engines and none came. He swam back where he had come from, but a strong current began to take him north and then east, away from the islands that he had just come from. He was exhausted, uh, completely exhausted, so he eventually let that current just take him. The next morning, as light dawned um, and as he was just floating there for several hours, he found, luckily, that he was not too far off course. He managed to swim his way back to the other men on um, the other men on the island, but he was thoroughly delirious and at that point only semi-conscious. Later that day, Ross made the same journey and, similar to Kennedy, reported no PTs. They knew at that point that they had to move to a bigger island. So they left in the same form formation, Kennedy towing McMahon with his teeth, the other nine around their improvised life raft. They arrived at the larger island known as Olasana. You can see that island right here. Ross and Kennedy left the next day again, swimming for another larger island, and that was Naru. The two men made it to Naru in about an hour. On Naru, there was the wreck of a Japanese barge, some canteens with water, and a two-person canoe and, a, and a, a, a box of Japanese candy and crackers. So after a drink and a brief rest on Nauru, Kennedy and Ross were walking back onto the beach when they saw two men out at the Japanese wreck. The men, who were clearly islanders, took fright and paddled away from the wreckage in their own canoe, despite Kennedy's hails. So that night, Kennedy took the canoe into the Ferguson Passage again in order to help spot any vessels, but did not see any. Kennedy decided to take the canoe back to Olasana the next day. He stopped long enough to gather the candy and the water to bring to the other men, and he left Ross to rest on Naru until the next morning. Arriving at Olasana, Kennedy discovered that the two men that he and Ross had seen on Naru had made contact with the rest of the crew. The two men, Byuku Gasa and Ironi Kumana, were the Islander scouts for the Allies. The two Solomon Islanders had been exhausted from their hasty, very hasty departure, running away from Kennedy and Ross on Naru, and they had stopped, they had decided to stop for coconuts at Olasana. And luckily, they met up with the crew of PT-109. The next morning, that was August 6th, Kennedy returned with Gasa and Kumana to Nauru and luckily intercepted Ross along the way as he was swimming back. So Kennedy was at a loss for a way to send a message for aid with these two guys, but Gasa showed him how to scratch a few words into the husk of a green coconut. The message read... Naru Island, Commander, Native Nose, Position, 
he can pilot 11 alive, need small boat, Kennedy. So the message, thanks to the Solomon Islanders, reached Lieutenant Arthur Evans, who was an Australian coast watcher stationed on Wana Wana. The crew of PT-109, thanks to all of this, the crew of PT-109 by August 8th were back at Rendova at the PT boat base there, thanks to the hard work of Ross Kennedy, the Australian coast, wa coast watcher, and of course, Gasa and Kumana. The injured men were quickly taken to medical and the rest were then interviewed by intelligence officers or war correspondents. And the accumulated strain of seven horrible days had really mounted up and luckily, Kennedy and the rest of his crew were sent back to the U.S. to rest and recoup. After several weeks in the hospital to recover, Kennedy was assigned command of PT-59. PT-59 at this point was purely a gunboat. She had been stripped of all the torpedoes and torpedo tubes and was equipped with extra 50 caliber guns, 40 millimeter guns. Um, but PT-59 was an older 77-foot Elko but was interestingly faster than PT-109. So for his courage and his leadership, Kennedy was awarded the Navy and Marine Corps Medal. Injuries um, suffered during the incident also qualified him for a Purple Heart. Ensign Lenny Tom also received the Navy and Marine Corps Medal as well. So Kennedy's courage and fearlessness during this situation, along with the rest of his crew, are really true testaments in my eyes to the strength and determination and resiliency, and are also great testaments and testimony to the resiliency and courage of PT boat crews. So that really sums it all up. I've got some recommended reading. If anyone wants to look into this a little bit further or learn a little bit more about PT boats, uh, please feel free. Uh, there's sort of quick reading list here. At Close Quarters, PT Boats in the United States Navy by John Bulkley is really the primer on all things PT boats and PT boaters. If you wanna know anything about the mechanics or the engineering and the layout, please read that. A very recent uh, publication or somewhat newer publication about PT-109 is PT-109, an, an American Epic of War, Survival, and the Destiny of John F. Kennedy. It's by William Doyle. It was published in 2015. It's really, really, really well done. Um, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about the other exploits of PT boats during World War II, Under a Blood Red, Red Sun, the remarkable story of PT boats in the Philippines and the rescue of General uh, General MacArthur by John Dom, 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 Domogolsky. So this is all about PT Squadron 3 and the rescue of MacArthur, and this is the true story behind They Were Expendable. Lastly, the best source for information on the loss of PT-109 is the official naval report um, by the U.S. Navy. It's available within the National Archives in digital format. You can also find a copy of the original document at the JFK Library in Boston. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing now and um, Mary, if anyone has any questions or comments in the chat. Yes, uh, so a couple of questions. Um, was there any record of a PT boat torpedo sinking a Japanese ship? So that is a little bit contested. Um, I, there is there is record of at least one uh, being a part of sinking a Japanese ship. Um, but yes, it's a little bit contested. The official records um, may or may not have been exaggerated by the U.S. Navy in order to recruit more PT boaters. All right. Uh, someone also asked, was this called Operation Crab since the division designator <laughs> spelled C-R-A-V? <laughs> That's funny. I didn't even notice that. That's really funny. I like that. If there was a, in my opinion, it should have been C-R-A-P. The other division should not have been B, should have been a P. But that's funny. I like that. I'm always going to, I'm going to call it that from now on. I like that. Okay. Someone says, was a lack of survival training or some other aspects of otherwise routine USN training for the PT crews because of the small size of the group, naval discrimination, or something else? Great question. Um, I'm not quite sure uh, why um, PT crews were not trained um, for survival in that way. 
I can only really theorize that perhaps the Navy didn't anticipate there would be so much of that. Um, they did a lot of training with pilots for that. Uh, you know, they had their, um, you know, their, their survival kits on them. And I think that's because the Navy and the Army, um, or at least the Army Air Force, knew that that was something the pilots were going to have to do. But I can only theorize that they didn't anticipate that PT boaters were going to have to do that. Um, so I, I can't I can't answer that definitively, but I, I can really theorize that they just didn't expect that that was going to be a uh, side effect of what happens to many PT, what happened to many PT boat crews. Yeah, and it's, um, this is a story that I didn't know a lot of the details behind. And it, it really is, um, it, you know, it's a bit like Apollo 13. The whole thing sounds so wildly improbable that you just, it's mind boggling that anyone managed to survive at all. And, yes. and like you said, it's just a huge testament, not only to their courage, but to their quick thinking. What can we possibly salvage as the remnant of the ship is going down? Um, just uh, sheer uh, determination to not give in mm -hmm. and not give up on each other. Yep. Um, just really an, an absolutely uh, remarkable story. Mm -hmm. so there's, thank um, you. there's a great example in the PT 109 book that was published in 2015. Um, a lot of the story came from interviews with the crew that survived. And there's a great story of Kennedy um, Harris, who had hurt his leg, was from Massachusetts or Boston. And Kennedy was like, hey, come on, you're a Bostonian. You should know how to swim. Let's go. Let's go. You know, we've got to get back to the wreckage. And um, Harris was like, no, no, leave me here. Leave me here. I'm done for. Leave me here. And Kennedy was like, no, get it together. We're going to survive this. I'm paraphrasing. That's sort of the Cliff Notes version. But um, there's some really, really great um great quotes there um and it, you're right it was very a very harrowing experience that most people would think this is it i'm not surviving this um yeah they absolutely did. they did absolutely all righty well i guess we're going to leave it here for today oops wait a minute something just popping in uh very informative thank you my father mm. uh survived on ron 15 in the mediterranean mm -hmm. would like to hear what you might know about that campaign so the mediterranean the role of um pt boats in the mediterranean was actually kind of interesting um they were under a lot of um a lot more of a traditional naval uh warfare in the Mediterranean. And um, it was really a hotbed of activity, especially off of Italy. Um, I really don't know a lot about um, specific battles or anything like that, um, but they were often out there um, as uh, rescue vessels. They would lay a lot of smoke screens down. Um, they weren't necessarily involved as a heavy hitter, um, especially because those torpedoes were just so bad and they didn't have heavy armament aboard like a battleship could or an aircraft carrier holding many um, aircraft. But um, they were really great sort of speedy in and outers. Um, squadron 15 um, is um, was actually quite a famous squadron because it was a large squadron. They had 18 vessels in it most of the time. Um, there's there's a lot of great reading um, by the Navy about um, their their role in the Mediterranean. Um, there was also uh, PT boat um, squadrons up in the Aleutian Islands as well, which I'm sure you can imagine was a vastly different experience for them um, being up in the very 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 cold Pacific and not the tropical ex uh, Pacific experience. Um, it's very it, PT boats can really get all over the place. Um, and now I do believe there were a lot of um, a lot more death of uh, PT boaters in the Pacific than the Mediterranean. I'm trying to think how many PT boats went down the Mediterranean. Um, they were they were really responsible for sort of stopping the um, Nazi supply line through Italy. Wow. So. <clears throat> uh, someone uh, uh, adds. Uh, 
uh, recommending both the book and the movie, they were expendable. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I completely agree. Um, the Under the Blood Red Sun is all is the sort of true, the, the nonfiction um, version. I mean, the, the, the film They Were Expendable is very, um, it's Hollywood eyes, but it's very, very good. Um, the film about PT-109 is also quite good. Um, it's it's also Hollywoodized, um, but hey, it really does a good job at setting the scene. Awesome. All right, we are going to leave it there for now. And uh, just a couple uh, notes to folks. Uh, if you were one of the people desperately trying to get into the shell and resin workshop only to discover that it was full up, now is, now is your moment. We've had someone who's canceled. We have two seats available. So if you're interested in booking those, send us an email at info at capecodmaritimemuseum.org and uh, we will get back to you and uh, see if we can make that happen. We've got two seats. So uh, then coming up uh, two weeks from today, we have uh, the museum's own Megan Riley, the director of our Young Mariner program, who's going to be talking about strange sea creatures. So I think that one is going to be a lot of fun. And on Tuesday, December 13th, we have a special decorated, sorry, decorative box workshop. This is a chance to decorate a small wooden box with shells. It makes a lovely holiday gift. Um, children are welcome to attend. Anyone uh, under 16 does need to be accompanied by a parent. And you can sign up for that on our website as well. There'll be cider. There's going to be holiday music. So we're going to make it uh, a festive little afternoon. So... Um, so until we see you again, uh, take good care and we look forward to seeing you at the museum. All right. Bye-bye.